Hello, my name is Mark Renz. I'm an extension weed specialist at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and today I'd like to talk to you about how to identify some of our invasive perennial knotweeds that are in our landscape here in Wisconsin. Well, first off, I want to emphasize that perennial knotweeds that I'm going to talk about uh, can invade a really wide range of areas. Traditionally, we'll see them along roadside settings or uh, in urban areas, industrial areas like we can see here. But eventually, they can spread into a wide range of areas and, and really be quite impactful. Here's a picture at the bottom that shows you it invading the edge of a forest along an alfalfa field in rural areas. So while these are the initial sites, it definitely has the capabilities of invading a wide range of habitats. And we have to realize that most of these infestations originate in residential areas where they were purposely planted, like can be seen in this picture of a giant knotweed plant in northern Wisconsin. And this alone by itself it doesn't have much, if any, harm. The problem, though, however, is these plants don't stay put. They tend to migrate from these planted locations and move into natural areas. As we can see by this image, we can see several knotweed species plants that are actually moving down this path into this wooded area, too. And this is really where the, the problem is with this species and where we're seeing those impacts. And this plant can be highly impactful to our uh, environment or this host of plant species. Uh, our impacts can be wide ranging across uh, several different habitats, but really the key habitat we're most concerned about are, is our riparian and river systems. In these systems especially, we get incredibly large reductions in the biodiversity or what other plants and animals can exist in those habitats as well as we get large changes in the functioning of those ecosystem and ecosystem services. Uh, Japanese knotweed will channelize many of these rivers and streams. It will actually result in enhanced erosion as you can see here. And this has been widely observed in northeastern United States as well as the northwestern United States. Not nearly as bad in Wisconsin, but we do have several populations that are starting to gain a foothold in some of our river systems. And so this is really what we, our goal should be to prevent. But this impact doesn't just stop at some of our uh, natural areas. We can have some of our residential and business areas and some of our industrial areas can also be impacted from these perennial knotweeds. This plant, believe it or not, has the ability to grow through walls, concrete, asphalt, and even into walls through foundations of buildings. This has been a massive problem in Europe, particularly in Ireland and the UK. And in these areas, they've act actually enacted very specific laws that if you are selling property, you have to claim if that is free of Japanese knotweed infestations or not. If Japanese knotweed is known to be on that property, you have to have a management plan in place before you can actually sell that property. So uh, s clearly there are some significant impacts to businesses and homeowners and landowners from this plant species as well. So what do we have in Wisconsin? Well, we have three species that are regulated in Wisconsin. Uh, as you can see, here's a map to the right of the known infestations. We have almost a thousand known infestations throughout the state, but I would still consider this species an early detection species in most parts of Wisconsin. Uh, the three species we have are actually two individual species, giant knotweed and Japanese knotweed. And then the third species is actually a hybrid between giant and Japanese knotweed, which we call bohemian knotweed. A clear distinction between these species, Japanese knotweed was originally thought to be the most widespread species, so it's considered restricted by our Wisconsin invasive species laws. That means it can legally be on your property, it's encouraged to be removed, but it is only illegal to knowingly transport those uh, propagules or plants off-site. In contrast, giant knotweed and bohemian knotweed are, are prohibited species and those are actually illegal to be on your property and you're required by law to remove those uh, and manage those from your properties. 
Now, the interesting situation is Bohemian knotweed is, I'm seeing to be much more common on the landscape. And I think what we thought previously was Japanese knotweed is Bohemian knotweed, and there's quite a bit more of it than we thought. Giant knotweed tends to be very isolated in a few pockets, particularly in northern Wisconsin. So how do we identify these species? First of all, how do we identify that it is one of these perennial knotweeds that we're concerned about? Probably the first step is to look at the stems. They have these very large bamboo-like stems that are hollow on the inside, clearly have nodes and inner nodes. And when the plants are mature, these plants can get quite large, easily get over 10 feet tall, particularly with bohemian and giant knotweed. With Japanese knotweed, it can be closer to eight feet in height. So that's the first step to identifying these species. Another feature that we can look at with with these knotweed species is they have very distinct roots and rhizomes. Uh, the, these roots and rhizomes uh, can contribute upwards of 50% of the biomass of the plant, so they can be quite a bit, and really allow this plant to survive many of our man common management techniques like mowing, for instance. Um, also, many of these roots and rhizomes allow these plants to spread long distances and cause the creeping spread of these populations. There's been documented cases of these perennial roots and rhizomes to be spreading upwards of 65 feet from our parent plants. And so this is one of the main reasons why we're uh, so concerned about managing this plant. So how do we identify the different species? This can be quite challenging. The first thing probably I like to look at is the leaves. And giant knotweed is relatively easy to differentiate from the others by leaf size and shape. First off, it's going to be very large, uh, well over one foot in length when mature and fully expanded, closer to 16 inches in length. In contrast, when we look at those ja Japanese knotweed leaves, they're much smaller, less than eight inches in length, and um, tend to have that flat section at the base of the leaf, while giant knotweed tends to be more heart-shaped. Now the hybrid bohemian knotweed can actually look intermediate in between those two species. So it can be quite a bit different to identify. It's smaller than the giant knotweed, but does have some similarities when looking at Japanese knotweed. But the problem in differentiating the hybrid is, or bohemian knotweed, is these leaves can look quite a bit different depending on how much of the gen genetics is giant versus Japanese and so we can get a wide range of different looking leaves depending upon the genetics of the population. This is what makes it really really difficult to differentiate bohemian or the hybrid particularly from the Japanese um, knotweed species. So when I look to identify um, these different perennial knotweeds I'm really first looking at the plant size is the first step. When those plants are mature in the middle of summer, how tall do those plants get? If they're greater than 10 feet tall, that's a really good sign that it's either giant or bohemian knotweed. And if it's quite a bit less than 10 feet tall, it's an indication that it uh, very well could be Japanese knotweed. Also looking at that leaf size and shape can differentiate giant from bohemian and Japanese, but really can be a challenge when we're looking at um, differentiating between bohemian and Japanese knotweed. And there are several other characteristics that we can look at that can help us differentiate the hairs on the underside of the leaves, the flowers, um, and really I would encourage you to consult. Uh, we have a great knotweed fact sheet in Wisconsin that's pictured in the upper right hand corner. And if you really have some uh, good botanical skills, I'd recommend you downloading the key to identification of invasive knotweeds in British Columbia has some excellent keys that can really help you figure out exactly which knotweed species that you do have. But even with some of these resources we found that uh, really to get conclusive evidence we may need to do some uh, DNA testing to really get uh, that answer solidified. So just to show you what we're seeing in many of our plots here's a picture of a leaf when mature um, it's anywhere from seven to nine inches long, so clearly not wouldn't fit into the category of giant knotweed with this one population, but could be Japanese, could be Bohemian knotweed. Its base of the of the blade is quite flat, uh, and it does have a pointed tip, which makes us think, well, maybe it might be Japanese knotweed, but it could also be the um, hybrid. 
but when we wait till this plant matures and we look at its height we find that it's clearly well over 10 feet tall 10 to 12 feet tall if you see that white stake at the bottom of the screen that's a two and a half foot tall stake so you can see these are producing these massively tall shoots so therefore we feel fairly strongly that this is in fact the bohemian knotweed or the hybrid and most of the populations that we look at tend to fall into this um, this species and therefore we feel that uh, potentially many of the populations we're calling Japanese knotweed are likely bohemian knot. Now you may be wondering, we have a bunch of other non-regulated perennial knotweeds that you may be seeing on the landscape. Uh, should we be concerned about these? I think we do need to have some level of concern because many of these can be aggressive and in other states uh, we have seen some of these ornamental knotweeds spreading, but in some cases we have not seen these spreading too. So I would encourage you to keep a close lookout if you do have these in your backyard. Um, they can look quite unique and be quite colorful and we just need to be careful that they aren't spreading off of those areas that they do uh, are established. I would also warn you to plant these in an area that's uh, very well contained because many of these species can be very aggressive and very weedy in these environments and particularly these in urban environments. So while identification can be quite challenging, the good news really is that um, reports suggest that management is similar across all of these species. So if your goal is, is specifically to manage these species, identification isn't nearly as critical as, as it is with other species. And that's really, I think, some good news. The bad news, however, is that we have recently found that many of these perennial knotweed species can produce viable seed in Wisconsin, which previously was thought not to be the case. Uh, in some years, we think that the percentage viable is very low, but we have verified with multiple populations producing viable seeds, one in the Dane County area, one up north in the Polk County area. And this, this suggests that these seeds can be a source for long distance dispersal and it may be a problem because they may be actually spread by birds as well. So that does offer us some uh, significant concern. So to sum things up, we do have three regulated invasive perennial knotweeds in Wisconsin. Uh, two of the species that we see, giant knotweed and bohemian knotweed, are prohibited because initially we thought that those populations were quite small throughout the state. Um, Japanese knotweed the third species is thought to is thought to be widespread and res restricted. Although I would encourage you to look closely, many of those populations that we initially thought was Japanese knotweed turns out um, are actually Bohemian knotweed, the hybrid. Identification can be really tricky with these, and we've given you a few tips, but we encourage you to to really consult experts on that. And identification is really t uh, important, especially if you're using our invasive species rule NR40 to require management for those prohibited species. So we need to know if it's giant or bohemian because those are required to be controlled by Wisconsin state law, while Japanese knotweed is not required to be controlled. The good news though is management is similar across species and we'll be shooting another uh, video that will be discussing some of the management techniques that are effective and commonly used throughout Wisconsin and the outlying region. Thanks for your time and good luck with perennial knotweed identification. Thank you for watching this video from the Wisconsin First Detector Network. To learn more about our network or to access additional information about invasive species in Wisconsin, please visit our website or contact us.